Med founder and CEO of the Business of Fashion. I am still in London in lockdown. Um, but as usual, we are connecting with our favorite thinkers, commentators, experts, and analysts all around the world for um, BOF Live. Uh, today's guest is someone that I have actually known since the very, very early days at BOF. Um, in fact, Scott Galloway was the first person to ever tell me that I should turn BOF into a business. And we worked together a little bit when he was starting uh, the company L2, which recently was acquired by Gartner. Um, I wish I'd taken his advice a little earlier and maybe taken a little bit of his um, investment, but um, I only got to that point a bit later. But I'm really delighted to have Scott here with us today. Thank, thank you, Scott. Uh, thank you, Imran. It's nice to be with you. Um, so we had an avalanche of questions from our community for this particular conversation, and they run the real gamut. Uh, so we're going to cover a bunch of different topics today, but um, it would be remiss of me if I didn't start by you know, asking about the, the big question on everyone's minds at the moment, which is around uh, the virus uh, and its impact on the economy and society more generally. So I know you're one of these people who has a very analytical mind, who's always processing and taking things in. And you talk to so many different kinds of people and have so many different um, perspectives to share. I mean, how are you making sense of what the world is going through at the moment? Uh, we're gonna need a bigger boat. Um, so look, first off, let me acknowledge, um, tell me when we have better therapies or when a vaccine shows up and I can give you a more informed viewpoint. Uh, but I just think there's so many first and second order effects of this. I think this has, this may be on a very meta level show that American exceptionalism is a reconfigured tractor trailer that becomes a morgue. I think American exceptionalism, exceptionalism has been illuminated to be arrogance, uh, that a lack of cooperation with our allies in Europe and abroad, that defunding and delegitimizing government translates to death and disability. And I think we're seeing that up front, that despite thinking that, despite having more time to prepare for this, despite having spending more money on healthcare than any nation in history, despite thinking of ourselves as the most innovative place in the world, we can't get cotton swabs or PPE equipment to our frontline workers. And just this notion that a third of the people who belong to the party in power believe this is a hoax is just incredibly discouraging and I believe may signal that America has lost its uh, leadership in the world. We used to be the nation that would, that would bring the world out of something like this. Now we seem to be the nation that is keeping it there. Um, so I'm not here with a message of hope. I think it's bad for America. I think the markets will boom. I think the current, the class of IPOs that will come to the markets in the next three to six months will boom. I think the markets are going to accelerate, uh, but people conflate the markets with the economic health of America. The markets are nothing more than an indication of how the top decile of Europe and America are doing. And spoiler alert, the top 10% of income earning households in Europe and America are killing it. And when you talk about the NASDAQ, you talk about the best companies in the world who are gonna use this opportunity to consolidate their share and power. Google and Facebook will come back with 70 cents on the dollar instead of 60 cents. E-commerce has gone from 18% in 18 years to 28% in eight weeks. So we have 10 year acceleration, a decade of acceleration in the last eight weeks. So you're gonna see Amazon become the most valuable company in the world so there's a, there's a winner-take-all economy that's bearing out, and we rub Vaseline over the lens of kind of the despair and the explosion and deaths of despair uh, happening across the U.S. and Europe because the NASDAQ is up. I would describe the American gestalt right now, and it's a very unhealthy one, is that the human race might go extinct, but that would be bad. But what would be worse if the NASDAQ goes down? So in sum, I think we're all fucked up. Um, I think that this is pulled back the curtain on 
some really shameful things in America that 50% of our populace, despite being the wealthiest nation in the world, is really vulnerable and can't go 60 days, much less 90, without a paycheck, which I think is just shameful. And even our rescue packages are nothing but an attempt to flatten the curve for rich people. We're going to find that our rescue package here was nothing but a giveaway to wealthy people. The wealthiest people in America are small business owners. I do a Zoom call tonight with all my college friends. All of us are blessed. All of us are the most, the most fortunate people in the world. We're all white heterosexual males born in the 60s that had access to incredible education for free called the University of California. We've all made a shit ton of money relative to our parents. And I'm the only one on the call tonight that hasn't taken PPP, a bailout. And the reality is none of them needed it. And they, mm. they talked themselves into believing that they were doing the right thing, but it was the wrong thing. So look, I, I, I think that we have tremendous um, fissures in our society that have only been revealed by this. And I'm not, you know, I hope I want to end on a, or end this rant, rant on a bit of a note of optimism. Ideally, we'll come out of this with a younger generation of people that realize that boomers have, have been exceptionally selfish, that hopefully we generate a generation of leaders or mature generation of leaders that realize cross-border cooperation is important, that viruses don't, don't care about walls or borders or xenophobia, and that we decide to stand shoulder to shoulder with our brothers and sisters in Europe and just be a little bit smarter about funding government and funding and investing. <laughs> pandemics, pandemics and pestilence have killed more people than war and violence, but we've spent $700 billion on our military and $6 billion on the CDC. I mean, it's just... I hope that it's a new generation of leaders that embrace our superpowers as a species, which is cooperation, and realize we need to reallocate capital to more efficient means. Anyways, I'll stop there. I mean, <laughs> a lot. thank you for your very thoughtful and provocative comments, because I think it really does take um, people calling out what's happening, it, happening and calling it out for what it is. Um, and, and on that note, you know, one company that you have covered extensively in your research of the past um, decade is Amazon. And I, you just mentioned it right now. And it's a company, you know, that you know, I think we all know has, um, you know, very much benefited from this current situation. It's also a company that's starting to get its tentacles into the fashion industry. So, you know, just to begin with on Amazon, I mean, what what do you see as the strategy that's being employed by Jeff Bezos now? Like, what, where is he taking that company? So Am Amazon is hands down, my book, The Four, was about Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. But if I wrote a sequel, it would be called The One, because Amazon is pulling away from absolutely everybody else. And their strategy has been incredible storytelling, match with execution, the results in such incredibly cheap capital that they can spend seven billion dollars on original content and as long as they take their renewal rates from 84 percent to 93 percent on amazon prime which is in 84 percent of u.s households it's worth 50 to 60 billion dollars whereas the rest of hollywood and media can't afford that type of loss making investment so their strategy of exceptionally cheap capital so they can over invest and put everyone else out of business or what we call dumping when the chinese tried to do it in the steel market in the 80s has been a very effective strategy and to their credit exceptional execution. I think we're in the midst of observing what I would call the fourth great unlock in shareholder value. So you think of unlock as a different approach to existing assets. It's not finding a cure for something. It's not coming up with a better, with an iPhone. It's saying, all right, how do we look at our current asset base and approach it differently and unlock hundreds of millions of dollars? And if you think of the big three unlocks to date over the last 30 years, I would argue in 2001, when everyone was saying stores were going away, Steve Jobs zigged while everyone was zagging and said, broadcast media, the ability to build brands via broadcast is declining. So I'm going to move into stores because the place you buy your computer is usually a place with steel racks, egghead software, a guy that looks like a registered sex offender takes your computer and gives it back to you three weeks later. And he said, I'm going to build these temples to the brand and I'm going to take a page out of the playbook of fashion and I'm going to have fashion shows for product releases. I'm going to advertise in Vogue and I'm going to make these LVMH like temples to the brand that call on our notion that the most beautiful things in the world are make us more godly, make us feel inspired, similar to what churches, mosques, and temples have kind of built into our instinct. And he opened 550 temples to the brand. And since then, 
the company has grown its market cap one point trillion dollars. People point to the iPhone. The iPhone's a great phone, but it's no better than a Samsung brand, but it has an Apple logo on it. And the reason it's able to get 38 points of margin versus most phones that get in the teens is that the brand is so incredibly strong. And I would argue the brand building move of the last 20 years was them going into distribution and taking money out of broadcast and doing $7 billion in lease. So that's unlock number one. Unlock number two is Amazon getting out of the business of serial dating and moving them from a transactional economy where you're always putting up a putting on a push-up bra and spandex pants and saying, hey, customer, come into my store again. Look how hot I am. Then they purchase and like, oh, shit, I got to go find somebody else. And they went into a recurring revenue business, which is a much better business, and they put a ring on it and got into this monogamous relationship with 88 or 83% of U.S. households called Prime. And all of a sudden, their company was no longer a retail transactional company. It was a recurring revenue software-like company. And that was probably a billion-dollar unlock. And Prime is probably you know, the most powerful loyalty program in the world, hands down, bar none. The third big unlock was Walmart saying, all right, we have MPS scores of 60 around our grocery. Amazon grocery is awesome. You have a thousand fabulous people watching this right now. Most of them would be happy with Amazon's grocery. They would not be happy, excuse me, with Walmart's grocery. They would not be happy with Walmart's in-store experience. So click and collect is all the great taste of their grocery without the tax of actually having to go into a Walmart and see how freakishly weird America is. And they just took these, these what everyone was thinking were liabilities, 5,500 well-lit, well-staffed warehouses called stores, and they turned them into small distribution centers and said, use the app, bomb into this warehouse called a, a Walmart store, pick up your groceries, bomb home. We have a warehouse within five or seven minutes of 60% of the U.S. population called Walmart stores, and this unlocked 300 billion in value. I think the fourth big unlock was revealed two weeks ago when, when Jeff Bezos said his investors should take a seat and that he was gonna take the $4 billion in profits they were expecting that quarter and reinvest it in protocols, compensation, distancing, and uh, additional cleansing materials and processes to basically create the earth's first vaccinated supply chain. So no other company can do this. He's going to basically create the perception that if you're a vendor, a partner, a customer, uh, an employee, and you work in the Amazon supply chain, you're less likely to contract a virus. And that, to me, is so incredibly powerful because at the end of the day, strategy is what can we do that's really hard that other people can't do? FedEx and UPS can't do it because they don't control the front end. There are certain products that are just more pandemic unfriendly because they require people to pick and pack them together or they're heavy or whatever it might be. Then you have a Walmart, can't control the back end because they use FedEx and UPS. Amazon is the first company with the capital division and the vertical nature of supply chain to offer what will, I believe, be the first vaccinated supply chain. And then, you know, similarly, Disney is trying to offer vaccination as a competence by saying to the NFL and the NBA, come to our facilities and we'll manage it very tightly. But I think the fourth unlock was Amazon uh, proposing vaccination. I also believe that AWS will be the most valuable company in the world after it's spun by 2023 and 25. And also the thing that might take Amazon from 2 trillion to 3 trillion is their entry into healthcare, which they are clearly doing. The most disruptable business in the world, maybe the exception of my business education, is US healthcare. Not as much about saving money, but about saving time and a combination of Alexa, your purchase history, their supply chain, their platform, their technology, they're going to, you're going to come home one day and Alexa is going to say, Imran, would you like to cut your health care costs in half? Or would you like to spend less time managing your child's diabetes? If you're a mother managing your child's diabetes, you spend 12 to 16 weeks of your life a year managing that child's diabetes. And I think Amazon and other health care providers are going to, or online health care providers are going to offer this unbelievable unlock of time savings using intelligent cameras, pre-purchase history, voice, in-home cameras. And I think COVID-19 is accelerating that. Anyway, I think Amazon is unstoppable uh, right now. I think the Department of Justice, I love them. I own their stock. It's one of the reasons that I'm economically secure as I've owned Amazon stock for about 12 years now. Uh, but they should absolutely be broken up. They're suppressing innovation. Oh, no, almost nobody can compete with them. But Amazon is firing on all 12,000 cylinders right now because of their entry into healthcare, vaccination, and their supply chain. So Amazon's also a company that's been dabbling 
or trying to dabble in a space that you used to cover when, during your time at L2, the fashion industry. Um, you know, recently, uh, I don't know if you saw, they revealed that they were going into partnership with uh, Vogue and the CFDA to kind of work on a, um, effectively like a sample sale or a clearance sale for some of the designers who had been impacted by the crisis. I'm just curious, you know, you know, given that so many of Amazon's strengths, the ones you just mentioned, are really more utilitarian, functional, um, you know, process-driven. You know, do you ever see them making a successful foray into lu the luxury space and the fashion space, which they've been eyeing for a while? So this is one of the rare few spots where Amazon has stubbed their toe and just hasn't really. I mean. I I'll turn this back to you in a second, but they, they haven't they haven't really gotten a lot of traction in the high end luxury market. And they've been, they always announce big hires. Vogue and a last gasp for relevance as they are like Rolling Stone 10 years ago, relevant now and every day they become less relevant is trying to accessorize an analog outfit with digital earrings and say, oh, we're partnering with Amazon. We get it. We're young. But Amazon can. I mean, luxury is such a fantastic place for e-commerce. It's attractive because if you look at at the end of the day, your margins are largely a function of value to weight. So there's no value to weight ratio like luxury, right? Take, take some moisturizer, uh, throw it in a beautiful Le Mer packaging, and boom, we have something that's worth more than on a weight basis. I think that's 60% of the value of gold. And so you have incredible, I mean, it's just, it was born for e-commerce, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of profitability. The problem for Amazon is that most people who own luxury firms don't have their head up their ass and have seen what's happened to every other sector where Amazon, quote unquote, partners with you. Amazon partners with an industry the way a virus partners with a host. And that is it usually ends up very poorly for the host. And luxury, to their credit, has said, you know, we've seen what's happened to TV. We've seen what's happened to print. We've seen what's happened to CPG. And hold on, brother, we're, we, we're just not going to go down that route because luxury's, luxury's ability to maintain their margins is so much about, you know, you go into, <laughs> you go into um, a, a, a Celine store, you go into an Hermes store, and you just think, okay, everything's curated. There's a romance here. There's an incredibly attractive high EQ person helping me. I just, the romance, the feeling... It translates directly to margin, and Amazon is algorithmically driven, meaning that if you type in booty, you're going to get the best-selling booty, which was something that was that's seven years old. Mm -hmm. Whereas one of the keys, especially retail and especially luxury, is that I want to pay someone from John Barbados, John Barbados, who has better taste than me, to make me feel 54 again. And if I type in leather jacket that makes me feel younger, I'm going to get a bunch of shit that, that just is, that is, that is algorithmically driven, as opposed to I want luxury is about someone with better taste than me, who's not saying what's been the best thing looking back, but trust us on this, this is what you're going to want to be wearing in a year or two years. And that's the opportunity is to be more progressive, to be younger, to be more attractive to a, a, a broader pool of mates, to feel closer to God. And algorithms so far can't do that. So Amazon is the killer of all joy and luxury as a distribution channel. So what you might see in the pandemic is a few luxury brands become so desperate for cash that they give up and they start distributing on Amazon. So far, so far, the big players, the LVMHs, the Estee Lauders of the world, you know, they'll dabble. Burberry will give a couple skews to the Amazon luxury beauty shop. But to their credit, I think Richemont, these guys, they're smart. And they're like, you know what? We've just seen how this turns out. Uh, so I don't think I'm not hopeful. That's one of the few places I don't see Amazon booming over the next several years. What do you think, Imran? You're closer to this than I am. Well, um, I, I concur with many of your points, of course. And as you said, they've you know, stubbed their toe more than once in trying to get into the space. I do think in a world where you know, people are just uncomfortable going into physical stores and combined with a situation where uh, many brands just do have not built the retail e-commerce and supply chain infrastructure to
to, to meet the expectations that customers have, that vaccinated supply chain, they, they have a really, you know, if, if your luxury is time and you know what you want to buy and Amazon already has your credit card info, knows your address, uh, knows your delivery preferences, um, you know, may, you know, maybe for the, the, the right brands who can figure out a way of managing the, the experience for the customer, there's an opportunity. But I, I think the challenges are much, much, much uh, more significant in this space than in other industries. And, you know, I, I think about brands like Chanel, for example, who have been e-commerce holdouts since the beginning of e-commerce holdouts, and they're still e-commerce holdouts. So I just wonder about, I'm not expecting Chanel to jump on Amazon anytime soon, but there's a lot of players out there that have, are either severely handicapped or completely unable to meet customer needs via e-commerce channels right now. So if someone came to us and said, all right, here's limitless capital, let's start a business. I think a decent business to start right now would be to create the high-end Amazon. And that is LVMH right now should go to Richemont, Kieran Group, Estee Lauder and L'Oreal and say, all right, we're going to build a platform. It's going to be a cooperative. We're all going to own a piece of this. And we're going to try and drive traffic to this, almost like Zalando, but turned in almost like what Hulu did in media. And that is create a cooperative and a platform because no one house has enough brands to create a cost of customer acquisition where they don't end up reliant on giving all their margin to Google or somebody else to drive traffic. And to your point, COVID-19 has sort of said to the players that don't have strong e-commerce, all right, you're going to lose 40 or 60 percent of your revenue. So TJ Maxx in the U.S., which was everyone's darling, doesn't have strong e-commerce and they're really paying the price for it right now. Uh, there are, you know, a place like Chanel, they're fine. The, the, the controlling family of Chanel, they're billionaires several times over. They can, they can sit on the beach in Saint-Tropez until this is all over and continue to pay their people. They'll be just fine. A, you know, an in, a small independent brand, like, a, I don't know, a Christian Louboutin or somebody who might find themselves in a cash crunch, those are the, those are the brands that might have to go on the platform. The the gangster move, if I was advising Amazon, and I used to, and as you can imagine, they are no longer interested in, in um, working <laughs> with me. Um, if I were Amazon, I would acquire Nordstrom. Uh, mm -hmm. Nordstrom, the Nordstrom uh, company is an amazing company, they have great execution. They have pre-existing distribution and relationships with luxury brands and beauty brands, some of whom might freak out and leave, but some would stay. And so Nordstrom- that's their, that's their whole foods play in fashion, potentially. 100%, because- Open your cabinets, open your cupboards, and Nordstrom has relationships with the best beauty brands, and the best fashion brands. Nordstrom is outstanding at e-commerce. They're in the same city. And I got to think at Thanksgiving, someone's brought up the notion in the Nordstrom family that every day we, this company gets worth less and less. Department stores were in the bottom of the seventh inning of their life. Now they're in the bottom of the ninth. The format just doesn't work. It's going away. And so the opportunity for them to partner with Amazon. Amazon gets distribution, some really nice warehouses. Uh, I think that's the only way Amazon gets into this business is through acquisition. And even then, I'm not sure how they can do it. But the guys who run, you know, the Johan Ruperts of the world, the, the Arnauds of the world, you know, these guys are smart. And they look at Amazon and they're like, sorry, girlfriend, I'm just, you know, I'm not you going. You know, Mr. Mr. Rupert did make a proposal very similar to the one that you just described, which was that, I, and I think it was via or after their net Uke's net aporte acquisition, which was he said that he wanted to create a kind of platform for the luxury industry. And unfortunately, I think the, uh, the our industry is so competitive that you know Mr. Rupert, Mr. Arno, and Mr. Pino are not the kind of guys that necessarily want to collaborate on anything. So um, you know, let's see. Um, speaking just to of, stop there, just yeah. to put a pin in that. Yeah. That's exactly right. And what they don't realize, so you, when Johan Rupert says, I want to create a platform and you, I want you on it, Mr. Arno, I'm sure he's genuine, but he wants to be the largest shareholder and own it. Mm -hmm. And then Arno goes, well, no, I'm, I'm the wealthiest man in Europe. I want to own it. And then the, the Pinot, they're gangsters and smart. And I say gangster, that's a term I use to, for impressive people. So they all envision the platform as long as they own and control it. And what needs to happen here is a recognition that the panzer tanks have rolled into Poland. And if the British, Russians and, Ger and Americans can figure out a way to get along, the big luxury houses should figure out a way to get along. 
And they need to put their egos aside and realize, okay, if we don't band together here, eventually there is a pretty good chance that, I mean, it's already happened a little bit to Richemont because the Apple Watch, in my opinion, is a shitty watch. It's mostly about signaling that you're a part of the Apple brand. But the idea of, I just don't think it's a very good utile item. I think it's getting better. But it's basically sucked the oxygen out of the entire watch industry because it's it occupies 30 to 40 percent of all PR around watches has been around the Apple Watch. It's now a bigger business than I think Rolex and the second biggest brand. So they've already kind of I mean, the only place that I would argue that luxury has really got kicked in the crotch is around watches with the Apple Watch. But so far, the shark repellent has worked really well. But I agree with you. I think a platform an independent platform that is kind of like uh, run by a council. They're all shareholders. You take the thing public, it has its own management, its own leadership. They all sign long-term distribution agreements. But the problem is they all see themselves as, as you know the lead dog and none of them don't wanna be the lead dog. And until shit gets really serious, well, they decide, okay, let's, let's form an alliance, but we'll see. Well, what do you what do you think are the prospects? Let's move to kind of com- uh, consumer and retail behavior right now. And obviously, within the um, the kind of pantheon of uh, retail and consumer focused companies, you know, luxury and fashion has a big role to play. But obviously, you know, people are hurting right now. And there's, I think that two more people just filed for unemployment this week in the U.S. Um, similar issues all around the world. I mean, how how do you think the luxury and fashion industry is going to be impacted due to shifts in consumer preferences and behavior? The same thing will happen in luxury. So on a macro level, uh, most industries would kill for luxury's problem because effectively what we have decided in Europe and the U.S. is to create a series of economic, monetary, and fiscal policies that take money from young, middle-class, and poor people and give it to baby boomer rich people. Everything we do is about transferring wealth from people under the age of 40 who aren't rich to people over the age of 40 who are rich. Uh, The two largest tax deductions in the U.S. are mortgage tax interest rate deduction, where you get to deduct the interest you pay on your mortgage. Who rents? Young people. Who owns homes? Old people. That's a transfer of wealth. Capital gains tax. Who gets the majority of their income from current income and has to work? Young people. Who gets the majority of their income from investments taxed at a lower rate? old rich people. Everything is about a baby boom generation sucking younger generations and future generations with reckless debt spending so they can stay rich or get richer. That is the primary marketplace for luxury. So at the end of the day, almost every business lives and uh, dies on demographics. And what luxury has right now is this irresponsible, short-sighted, selfish generation of leadership that controls the majority of European countries and absolutely controls the US, where they've decided to no longer invest in future generations, but that the key is to keep old rich people rich. And that is the primary market for luxury. So the top 1% globally are killing it. And that is who primarily, primarily fuels luxury. The other component that fuels luxury is an emerging middle class across developing markets who have this very unhealthy approach to life where they'll live with their parents, take public transportation so they can buy one Birkin bag a year. That, that cohort is growing. So the perfect storm of good things for luxury will likely continue. There will be some examples of smaller independent players that can't survive the, the economic strain over the next 24 to 36 months. The big guys will come back stronger. They'll consolidate their ownership. They'll take the few independent hold, holdouts roll them up. The brands that were dependent upon department store or third party distribution will get hit hard. You can see maybe that some of the beauty brands have a difficult time, given that if you're going to spend 20 percent more time in your home, you're probably going to consume less makeup and there'll be a bunch of consensual hallucination that people want to feel better about themselves. That's bullshit. If you don't have to put a makeup on every day to traipse to Midtown or to London office, you're just not going to buy as much. Mm -hmm. So there'll be some losers. But on the whole, call it 12 to 24 months from now, just as it's happening in the, every sector, the strong are going to come back even stronger. The culling of the herd benefits the elephants that survive because when the rains return, there's more foliage. So the bigger players, unfortunately, are going to get bigger and stronger. 
Um, there'll be some losers. I think beauty will be challenged. The, the folks who have poor e-commerce, as you referenced, the folks still dependent upon department store and third-party distribution. But the forward-leaning investments that LVMH, Richemont made in vertical distribution, the forward-leaning investments they made in e-commerce, all of these are about to pay off in spades because when the market comes back, they have the balance sheet to survive this dip. And when the market comes back, they're going to consolidate smaller brands. All the human capital is going to end up, the best human capital is going to end up at the big the big places and they'll be just fine. So I think the majority of sectors in the world would pray for uh, luxuries problems right now. So what do you do, Scott, if you're an independent fashion brand right now and you're, you're not, you don't have this fortified balance sheet and you don't have uh, the kind of vertical structure from kind of manufacturing all the way to retail? I mean, how do you navigate this current situation? Sell. So, Really, I mean, look, there'll be there'll be some really well publicized examples of people who break through and do a good job. And, you know, you want capital light distribution, you know, you figure out a way to piggyback off of other people. And though these people will get a ton of press and WWD and on your side, or there'll be limited examples of people who break through. But the independent luxury brand is about to become the new independent magazine or independent ad agency. And that is It'll be aspirational, it'll be a neat place to work, and it'll likely go out of business. So it, it is a difficult, independent luxury and beauty brands right now are the independent magazines, single title magazines of 10 years ago. And that is while they're still hot and they still have strong brands, I would absolutely sell. Uh, they should wait because they don't want to come across as desperate. There will always be opportunities for people who break through, but one of the problems with a monopoly economy, and I want to be clear, I think the big guys, I sounded very sycophantic, I think they should be broken up. I think they've become too big. I think that if you want to- Even in luxury, even in luxury. Well, I'd like to see the market share, but I would bet that 60, 70% of the gross margin dollars in luxury in Europe are now going to the three houses. So- if you wanted to oxygenate the economy around luxury, if you wanted to create a, a new era of independent brands, you'd go in and break them up. And I, unfortunately, I think the Department of Justice here in the US has been asleep for 20 years. Marguerite Vestier is really focused mm -hmm. on big tech, but across every sector, you see too much power in too few hands. And I mean, you're, you're exceptional. There's very few. Think about how incredibly successful you are, and you have barely broken through and gotten oxygen. A tech company that had a quarter of your success would be worth a billion dollars right now. But trying to create an independent media company right now is nearly impossible with Facebook and Google sucking 60 to 70 cents on every online dollar. Yeah. And there'll be some examples of winners, but we live in an unhealthy environment where too few players across every sector are allowed to aggregate too much power. Mm -hmm. And luxury isn't as bad as big tech, but it's getting there. I bet the share of gross margin dollars coming out of this pandemic controlled by the big houses will be up 10%, whatever it is now which just makes it that much harder for the independent guys or the recent grad of a great you know, program out of, out, of, out of London or New York to start their own label, to start their own brand. There's too much concentration of power, too much of the spoils goes to too few players. I mean, this is a larger metaphor for the entire economy right now. Yeah, you, you touched very briefly there on the media sector. And I know you used to sit on the board of the New York Times a while back. Um, you know, the fashion media sector has also been massively disrupted by this situation. Uh, well, how do you see things playing out in, in media, in, in our industry? So media is, I mean, essentially the litmus test for media is, okay, there's Facebook, there's Google, and then the third emerging big media company is Amazon with Amazon Media Group, which is now the fastest growing $1 billion plus media company in the world. Outside of the, of the monopolies, the big guys, media is largely a function. The survivability index of media is pretty straightforward. Just look at the percentage of revenues they get from subscription versus advertising. So the New York Times gets about two thirds of their advertising or revenues from subscription. I think the FT gets about 55%. Those guys do fine because they can count on that capital. Even through the, the downturn of the recession or the pandemic, they're fine. They're strained, but they're fine. 
the Prosiebens of the world in Germany, the Viacoms here in the US, the Condé Nast of the world, that the majority of the revenue still comes from advertising, they are screwed because advertising has become a tax that only the poor, the technologically illiterate have to pay. Uh, how do you know your life hasn't turned out the way you'd want? You know too much about the new South Korean car company, Light Beer, or how to address opioid-induced constipation with the latest pharmaceutical. Advertising you can opt out of if you're wealthy and you can use these new streaming platforms. I can sign up. I mean, the New York Times only gets about, I think they get 62 bucks a year for pelting me with garbage ads that, that diminishes that gorgeous content from that 1100 person newsroom, which is the ultimate evangelist for Western values. I used to, Modern Family, my favorite show is Modern Family. And they get 42 cents for pelting garbage at me for nine minutes, interrupting um, that amazing 21 minutes of storytelling. So what do you know? Apple figured out a way to charge me $2.99, which on top of 42 cents, there's enough money to spread around everyone else. And, um, uh, and now I watch 21 minutes of uninterrupted modern family. The ad supported ecosystem is literally collapsing. It's just collapsing. Joe Rogan, Gets $100 million from Spotify, he'll have ads for a little while, they'll eventually put him behind a wall because subscription is the way it's going. So you're seeing essentially big tech come into media. If they can, if they can build media companies that create the loyalty, higher NPS scores, because media is very emotional such that they can sell more paper towels via Prime or more handsets via Apple, they can overinvest in media at a rate that traditional media players just can't afford. So media is going essentially going to bifurcate into two, uh, two winners, and that'll be the big tech guys who can monetize. I mean, basically the morning show. Have you seen the morning show, Imran? Of course, yeah. The morning show is Murphy Brown. It's a cute show on a $120 million budget. It makes no economic sense whatsoever. But it doesn't matter. As long as Apple sells a few more of these, they're fine. Uh, it takes... Amazon, $350 million of spending to win an Emmy. It takes HBO, $70 million. So Amazon is literally five times as bad at creating quality content as HBO, but it doesn't matter because if, if you're a little bit more likely to renew Prime, boom, it's worth it because they get three to five times revenue in the stock market, whereas uh, AT&T only gets one or one and a half times revenue. So there's this arbitrage out of traditional media players the ones that are on death watch are the ones that get more than 60, 70 percent of the revenue from advertising. You'll see big tech. You'll see subscription based companies such as yours. You pivoted to subscription because a guy, you know, who's who's sees the future in New York, told you to do that three years ago, despite the fact <laughs> you gave him no options and no, no credit and no equity in your company. But the reason why you're not roadkill right now. And selling to WWD for a dollar or for, to Condé Nast for a dollar in a big corner office that makes you feel artificially important is you pivoted to subscription. Mm -hmm. And that's where the media survivors are. And then there'll be this cesspool of ad-supported media that's personal injury attorneys and basically a, a, a long-winded narrative and how much it sucks to be old. You'll be pelted with pharmaceutical ads and, you know, walkers and, and hip replacement doctors and all that stuff. It's... Media is getting is getting decimated. Big tech has rolled into Hollywood. Um, and then the few survivors will be the ones that made the pivot that you made to subscription versus ad supported. Mm. Well, thank you for that um, crash course in the future of media. Um, I, I do want to I do want to talk about the space that you're really excited about, which is education. Um, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you've been up to. The, the reason I ask is because, you know, of course, you know, fashion students, like students around the world, you know, their graduations have been disrupted by the virus. And, you know, future students are sitting at home right now wondering if they should go and accept the offers that have been made to them at, say, Martin's or Parsons or other, other schools around the world. And, there's the disruption that this situation is going to have on education is massive. Yeah, it's it's something I'm I'm kind of thinking about. I'm thinking about a lot right now, and I, I'm, I'm I've been talking about this a lot. It's a passion point for me. The reason I am here with you right now, the reason why I get I, I you know I have a a, a nice life, is uh, you know 
And by the way, I'm not modest. I think I am remarkably talented, Imran. I think I'm in the top 1%, which, by the way, puts you in a room the size of Germany. I'm in the top 80 million globally. Yay for me. So let's start with that. I'm not, this isn't a humble brag. But the reason why I live an extraordinary life is through the generosity and vision of California taxpayers and the regents of the University of California that let me get an undergraduate degree at UCLA and a graduate degree at the University of California, Berkeley, the finest public institution in the world, for a total tuition, a total tuition of all seven years, because I spent a fifth year at UCLA making bongs out of household items and watching Planet of the Apes trilogies <laughs> over and over and over. Total tuition, undergrad and graduate degrees of $7,000. No student debt. I had the confidence to start a business because I had no student debt. I could buy a house. I mean, it just changed my life, the generosity of taxpayers. My class, I start on September 1, 170 kids are supposed to show up. We'll see if that happens. I, we, NYU charges them $7,000 to take my class, just that one class. Times 170, that's $1.2 million for me doing what I'm doing with you, 12 nights. That's $100,000 a night for me and a bunch of PowerPoint slides. That is morally bankrupt. It results in young people starting household formation later. It makes them less risk aggressive in terms of businesses. It, it inhibits their ability to build wealth via buying their own homes. It is morally bankrupt. And, and U.S. education has been preying on the hopes and dreams of middle class families for four decades. We've raised our prices faster than health care. We've raised our prices 1400 percent. We've never cut costs. We have the most expensive social welfare in the world called tenure, which is nothing but debt on young people. And COVID-19, this fist of stone, is about to meet the chin of higher education that we have been sticking out for the last 40 years. And people are realizing, if I'm not going to get my kid into an amazing school, everyone talks about the Ivy Leagues. Ivy Leagues only educate 64,000 students a year total combined. Cal State has half a million students. Ohio State has 50,000. So you have essentially a group of people uh, across the nation seeing their kids' Zoom classes and going, this is what I'm paying $58,000 a year for? So for the first time, we're going to have what I would call a real open and honest conversation around, is education worth it? And the answer is no. And also some very ugly features. If you're from the top 1% of income earning households in the U.S., you're 77 times more likely to get into an elite college. And then at elite colleges, we pour Vaseline or Neosporin off of this morally bankrupt activity by letting in some remarkable middle class and lower income kids, and they are remarkable. So essentially in the US, in Europe you have a caste system or US or used to based on your last name. In the US we also have a caste system. We pretend we're a meritocracy, that's total bullshit. We're a caste system, but it's based on not your family name, but where you went to college. Show me someone who gets a double E degree out of Dartmouth. I'll show you someone making $300,000 a year by the time they're 30 or 35. Show me someone with a GAD, GED lives in Little Rock. I'll show you someone who's lucky they're making 50 grand. We have a caste system called education, called the degree you have. And who have we decided gets to get all the spoils, gets to go to the big schools? Simple. The children of rich people and freakishly productive people between the ages of 15 and 17. Imagine the pressure placed on people who see the spoils you can have in America. Never been a better time to be in the top 1% in America. And we tell our 15 to 17 year olds, OK, unfortunately, I don't have my name on the side of a Stanford building. So I need you to be freakishly fucking impressive and productive from the age of 15 to 17. I need you to be captain of the lacrosse team. I need you to be, you know, all AP courses. I need you to get a 4.5 GPA. And then if you can't build wells in Africa between the ages of 15 and 17. And what do you know? What do you know? Teen depression is skyrocketing. So we have created so much anxiety so much despair, so much pressure, and instead of 40% of high school applicants getting into UCLA like when I applied, now it's 14. So we have created this Hunger Games-like economy cast system, and the primary arbiters of this Hunger Game casting is yours truly, and it needs to stop. We need to dramatically lower the cost of education. We need to dramatically expand the seats across the best universities. My cohorts have totally lost the script. We no longer see ourselves as public servants. We see ourselves as luxury brands who brag that 90% of applicants got turned away. That's like the head of a homeless shelter bragging that they turned away 90% of the applicants last night. Good for fucking you. We need to return to the basic script of higher education. That is the upward mobility 
of unremarkable kids like I was. We have lost the script. The disruption is coming. It couldn't come at a better time. No people deserve it more than me and my cohort. That was a lot. That was a lot. So, so what does it look like, Scott? Like I, I read the recent article that you or interview you did with New York Magazine. Can you just describe what the future of education looks like? Well, I can tell you what I hope it looks like. I hope that I hope that I'm doing a call with the Chancellor of UCLA this week, and I'm hoping that that I can help him. And we take this opportunity to partner with big and small tech. It's not just Google and Apple. It's Slack. It's Zoom to figure out a way such that we can reach deeper into high schools, have hard conversations with our faculty about cutting costs. We have social welfare for the undereducated called food stamps and and council housing and unemployment. And now we have social service for the overeducated called tenure. I work with the best faculty in the nation. A third of them should be put on an ice flow or they should have their salaries cut dramatically. Every industry in this world, in the economy has had to cut costs at some point except my industry, which for the last 40 years has just raised prices so we can all pretend we're noble and pay ourselves more. We need dramatic cost cutting and then we need tech to dramatically expand the enrollments if you take 50% of your courses online, you've effectively doubled the size of your campus. So the University of California educates 200,000 kids. We need to educate half a million. We need taxpayers to start recognizing that investing in our future involves investing in education as opposed to investing in tax cuts for the rich or in never ending wars. And we need to go back to where we were in the 70s and 80s and that is the son of a single immigrant mother who is not remarkable uh, yours truly, gets into a remarkable school. The whole point of America and our education system used to be, just be good, just be good, and we'll give you remarkable opportunities. Now it's you better be remarkable, otherwise you're fucked. If you don't get into the right slipstream, the right current at the age of 18 in the form of the best school, you're not gonna have access to Google, Apple, Amazon, and Facebook, because they only recruited the best schools. And your life starts that slow downward spiral to being working for Instacart or being an Uber driver. It is so much pressure. We need to dramatically expand enrollments at our best universities, our public land grant universities, which are the jewels, in my opinion, of America. We need to lower costs and we need to start grabbing more and more young people by the scruff of their necks and flinging them into the future that was waiting for me when I was 18. So I, I think it's a, con I think you asked me what we need to do. We need our public land grant universities to have more funding. They, they cut costs, which results in 50 to 100% dramatic increase in enrollments. And we need to massively fund an apprenticeship program across the universities that can't sustain through a liberal arts education program and create a new gestalt in America where the only, that says the only, you know, that says that there's more than one way to a better life than getting a four year degree. That, you know, there's, there's, there's honor and craftsmanship. There's honor in blue collar work and start figuring out a way to train people. There's huge demand right now for what you would call, you know, worker or skilled craftsman jobs in the US. But we tell every 18 year old, that's shitty work. Don't do that. You got to work for Google and you got to get a four year degree. So we need a change in approach. We need a change in funding. We need Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google and the best companies in the world to stop using universities as an HR department and find a track for people in their companies, an opportunity for people that maybe didn't get a college degree. So I think we need a total reworking of the university system in the United States. I think in Europe, you're a model. You don't have, in Germany, they don't have this elite system. What they have is a lot of good schools that are largely free or mostly free. Britain is much better than we are. You know, you have your own issues, but I would argue that Europe presents a much more interesting model. They've invested much more in apprenticeships. It's better to have a lot of good schools as opposed to a few luxury brand schools. Mm -hmm. So I think Europe presents a good model, but U.S. education is something that needs dramatic retooling. And I hope this pandemic is an opportunity to inspire that discussion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I really relate to your experience of um, attending uh, UCLA because, you know, I went to public university in Canada, because we only have public universities, really. And, you know, the kind of education that you can get, at, you know, I think I paid. Were you McGill? Yeah. $1,800 of tuition in my first year, which, you know, was not, not, you know, 1993. So, 
The world has changed. Um, Scott, we have so many questions coming through. Um, I, do, I, I don't want to take up all the time. So I just, I do want to turn it over. The first question is from Nazreen Nazir. So we're just going to wait for Nazreen to come on screen so she can ask her question. She's coming, I'm told. Well, if she doesn't end up coming, I do have her question here. So I can just ask it on her. Oh, there she is. Hi. Hi, Hi Nazreen, how are that. you? I'm good, thank you. Hi, Where I'm are you Scott. in the world? Um, I'm in Kuwait. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. Uh, what's your question for Scott? Sure, so basically it's um, around fundraising and just the general m and um, outlook in uh, fashion in general, like what you've seen and what you expect to see in the long term as well. Uh, it's in two parts. So basically the first part, I'm just wondering about startups that haven't launched, but were thinking of launching and, you know, have rightly put it off, especially in DTC, uh, maybe couture or resort wear, swimwear, no one's buying these things. So do you have any advice on um, when they could think about launching and, you know, fundraising? six months down, 12 months down, never. And the other question is, those who have been fortunate enough to raise capital, especially in their early stages, you know, either in pre-seed or seed, do you have any advice on how they should move forward with keeping that money, you know, sort of pacing out their runway? Or um, what would the outlook be like for fundraising in the next few months? Would, can they expect to raise a second round soon or not? Uh, thanks, Nazreen. So a lot there. So I'll talk about, okay, so there's, there are, um, so the big guys, the market for M&A, I think there's going to be a lot of M&A. Right now, everyone's paralyzed. They're focused on different things. Um, but I think in three to six months, you're going to see a lot, a flurry of M&A activity because uh, the bigger houses are going to be able to buy stuff kind of on the cheap, just as there's a bunch of golf investors buying, making huge investments in great companies in the U.S., their attitude is we get stuff on sale. So there's a lot of probably smaller luxury brands whose valuation expectations will have come down dramatically. So there'll be tremendous opportunity for M&A. Now, let's say you're a, and then I'll start with a small company that's, that's raised money and is, is out there right now. What do you do? And this is situational. You gotta obviously look at the current, the company and its specific situation, but I would argue generally speaking, you need to cut costs. And that is you need to look at every line item and say, should we eliminate this or should we negotiate it down? I have a small company, an online education company. We got very lucky. Our enrollments have tripled in the last 60 days through no fault of our own because obviously a lot of people are at home. Doesn't matter. I went through every item and I said, show me every expense. And we had something like 730 expenses every month. And I'm like, okay, do we need this research? Yeah, it's essential. Okay, call them and ask for 30% off. This is a pandemic. Call our landlord, tell them, I know this sounds terrible, call our landlord and tell them we're not paying. <laughs> and uh, what's the new deal? There's this hallmark vision of what it means to be a startup, that we all have benefits and bring your dog to work and we have the best snacks. Small companies are hand-to-hand -hand combat and you need to be all over everything all the time. And this is an incredible opportunity to cut costs. I went through every contractor. There's also this Hallmark cartoon of, yeah, everyone gets to take paternity leave. No, they don't. It's a fucking startup. It's a startup. And I realize how unaspirational that is. But you're a startup. I mean, you should be, anyone with a startup right now should be saying, do I eliminate this cost or do I reduce it? It's one or the other. It's one or the other. It's a great time to go through and say who's performing and who isn't. And then tell the people who aren't performing, you need to start. And none of this is what entrepreneurs want to say out loud, but this is what every successful entrepreneur does. In terms of starting a business, in about six, in six months, the next two years will be the best time to start a business. I've started nine, and I'm generously kind of three, four, and two. I've had two total disasters. I've had four sort of okay outcomes, and I've had three, what you would argue, you know, modest to pretty good successes. And I go through all of them and I say, what's the signal from the noise? What are the, what are the things that drive success versus failure? And the only thing I could figure out was the part of the economic cycle when I started the company. 
And contrary to public opinion, when I started companies in boom times, they almost always failed. Mediocre people are expensive. Mediocre real estate is expensive. You can enter into consensual hallucination with your investors that what you're doing is working because you can raise money really easily. When you start a company in a recession or coming out of a recession, everything's cheaper. You can get good people for a decent salary. You can make smart investments. As you come out of the recession, you have wind at your back and companies want to try new things and do things differently. I had Imran speak in my, in 2010, I started at L2. Nobody was having events. It was the Great Recession. Everyone had canceled events. And I said, I'm going to do an event on social media and I'm going to get these really smart people, including Imran, to come talk about Burberry. And, and, and no one was doing events. We had 550 people show up that morning. So a recession is the best time to start a business. So a new, brand new business with a clean balance sheet, raise a little bit of money, throw nickels around like they're manhole covers. You have an existing small business. You are rapacious, Darwin. You are culling the herd. Every expense is your enemy to live on to fight another day. And you're going to see a lot of M&A activity because the people with cash right now, the pendulum has swung back. There are a lot of mediocre beauty brands being sold for eight times revenue. That's over. It's going back to a multiple of EBITDA. The corporate development guys at the big houses are going to pick up some really nice assets for a reasonable valuation. Nasreen, how's that? Nasreen, how's that for an answer? That sounds very positive, actually. So thank you, that informative. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank Our you. next question is from Jean Huang. I think, if I'm correct, a former student of yours. Hi, Jean. Hey, Jean. You're on. How's hey. it going? Good, how are you? Very Good well. See you. Good. Where are you? Do you remember me? I was in your brand strategy class a million years ago. Yeah, yeah. I didn't remember you. I didn't remember you until I saw your face. It's good to see you. Good to see you again. And as always, thanks for your provocative perspectives. Thank you. Um, I'm in Beacon, New York, and Ron Tancer, just north of the city. Um, so I know we're running short on time. So my question for you is um, coming out of the crisis, what innovations do you think are going to permanently impact consumer expectations and the shopping experience? Uh, so the basics, right? Um, we've, we've, we've accelerated 10 years of e-commerce in eight weeks. People are just getting much more comfortable. I'll give you an example. It's, it's the boring stuff where there's huge changes. Grocery will go from 2% of grocery online to 20%. And if you look at the US, that's a $700 billion market. So you're gonna see, you're gonna see a, what could be a $200 billion transition from terrestrial retail and grocery to online, which will create all sorts of opportunities around supply chain, cold, it, cold storage, like innovation around that. Ocado, a company that picks and packs, you know, there's just gonna be this quarter of a trillion dollar overnight a wind in the sales of online grocery. Obviously, DTC will become more important. I don't think retail is going away, but it's going to be very stressed. Brick and mortar will be very stressed for a while. Um, and then I see the two biggest or the most exciting places will be in education and, and uh, telehealth and remote medicine. And I think there'll be opportunities to take some of the skills that people have around brand management and the customer experience and luxury and take that to health. Like who's gonna be the luxury brand in healthcare? And they will emerge, right? And I mean, right now, and one of the dirty secrets, if you give a bunch of money to Langone, when you get really sick, you go to a floor that feels like the four seasons for your healthcare. How do we take that online? How do we take, there's gonna be all sorts of segmenting of the marketplace, but if I were coming out of college or if I were an entrepreneur, I'd be thinking about uh, online education or online learning and how I take some of the great lessons of luxury in terms of voice, artificial scarcity, artisanship, and try and bring it to those those industries. Um, but there's going to be there's going to be huge shifts, no doubt about it. Gene, what are you up to these days? What are you doing? Well, actually, after I took your class, I um, pivoted into brand consulting. So, and I, I bounced back and forth between that and beauty. So, I last saw you, I think, when I was at Dior Beauty. But now I'm an independent brand consultant and um, handbag entrepreneur by night. So, I'm hoping to be one of the successes coming out of this recession. Nice. Well, that's great to hear. So, stay in touch and recruit at Stern, Jean. <laughs> thank you. Maybe I will. Thanks. Good to see you. Good Jean, see you. Thank, thank you for you. your question. Thanks so much. Scott, we've run out of time. I knew this was going to be 
a fascinating, provocative, and can I interrupt you for for one second, Imran? Yeah, sure. I'm self conscious because I've been so cynical. I want to end on a positive note. Please do. Um, uh, I think that there is an enormous opportunity. I think there's a meaningful opportunity coming out of COVID nineteen, and I think there's a profound opportunity. The meaningful opportunity is if you are healthy and fortunate enough to be able to do your job like you and I can do from our home. You know, in NASCAR, there's this dramatic footage of people winning at the at the finish line. But the reality is that the race is won in the pits. And that is while everyone else is is down, can you lap the competition? So if you're blessed to be able to work right now, you want to work really hard. You want to turn on the jets while everyone else is in the pits. That's a meaningful opportunity. But I think the profound opportunity is something much more, uh, uh, much more important, and that is uh, the repair and cementing of really important relationships. I've been thinking a lot about this. I think each of us needs to ask, you know, are we, do we have the relationship with our parents that we want? Do we have the relationship with our siblings that we're proud of? Have we let friendships wane because of perceived slights or competitiveness or not investing in them? But Lenin said, uh, sometimes nothing can happen in decades and sometimes decades can happen in weeks. I think there are so many people out there who are uh, struggling and, and, and insecure about what is going on right now that I think the opportunity to bring grace and forgiveness and, and, and love and generosity to relationships creates this enormous opportunity to, to strengthen relationships. So there's a meaningful opportunity to lap the competition professionally here but there's a profound opportunity for the repair and strengthening uh, of relationships. Okay, well, thank you, Scott. That was um, an unexpected um, epilogue to the conversation. Um, I'm really grateful for the time. It's always nice to talk to you. Uh, I hope we can do this again because um, I really find your perspectives so illuminating in, in many, many ways. Um, so uh, stay safe. Good luck with the new business. Uh, is this your 10th one? 10th one, brother. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. you are the definition of the serial entrepreneur. Uh, we all look up to you. <laughs> and um, and uh, uh, thanks again for your time. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining for all, from all around the world. As always, uh, I'm Imran Ahmed, founder and CEO of the Business of Fashion. Tune in for more episodes of BOF Live if you want to explore and understand uh, what, what is coming, check out businessoffashion.com slash events. Tomorrow, Scott is followed by Naomi Campbell and Derek Blasberg. So I will be chatting with them tomorrow afternoon, London time. Tune in to learn how to make an amazing YouTube show, which as many of you have seen, Naomi has managed to do somehow. That's all for now. Speak soon. Bye. <laughs>